One of the most requested 3D printers for me to review last year was the Voxelab Aquila. This came right after my review of the Ender 3 V2 and the printer had just about everything that machine had but at a pretty heavy discount. Fast forward to a couple of months ago and Voxelab reached out asking if I was interested in testing out their brand new Aquila S2. Looking at the spec sheets, it definitely had some things I liked like a powder coated PEI flex plate, a direct drive extruder, but the one real big standout feature to me was that it had an all metal hot end capable of hitting 300 Celsius. This is something that we really don't see on a $300 3D printer and I agreed to do the review. Over the past couple of months, I've had time to play around with the S2 and see what it is all about. So in today's video, it is going to be all about the Aquila S2. We'll go over the printer specs, what the setup and assembly was like, how the machine prints, and of course, I will give you my final thoughts and conclusion on this printer based off my experience with it so far. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Starting with the specs, the Aquila S2 is an open frame 3D printer made out of aluminum extrusions with a build volume of 220 by 220 by 240 millimeters. The S2 has manual bed leveling via four large knobs and comes fitted with a magnetic flex plate system and powder coated PEI bed. Unlike the original Aquila S2, it uses a direct drive extrusion system and has an all metal hot end capable of hitting 300 Celsius, which is the real standout compared to similar priced machines on the market. It has one fan for cooling the hot end and a fairly small layer cooling fan. The motion system uses V-slot wheels and the Z-axis is driven up and down by a singular lead screw. There are built-in belt tensioners on both the X and Y axis and you have the option of printing with a micro SD card and the 4.3 inch screen or connecting via micro USB to a computer. The LCD screen appears to be the same as the previous Aquila but the orientation is now vertical instead of horizontal. The interface is functional, but gives you very little control over the machine settings. I did open up the housing for the controller on the S2 to take a look inside, where I found a 32-bit board with a Nation N32 chip and what I believe are Trinamic drivers. It is a pretty tight fit with the wire bundle, but I did see that the board has a replaceable fuse and a port for adding an optional filament runout sensor. There's also a small fan for helping with removing heat from the board. The S2 was packaged very nicely and we did the entire unboxing setup to first print on the ModBot Army channel. So if you're interested in checking that out, I will have a link in the description of this video. On stream, it took us about an hour to assemble the 3D printer, but that was with us really prodding the machine, taking things apart, answering questions. I would say for your average person, it's probably about a 30 minute build until you are able to run your first print. Unboxing and setup was fairly standard, but it was interesting to see that they included some really small strands of carbon PETG, carbon PLA, PETG, and nylon, which are just not things you normally see included with a 3D printer. The nozzle on the machine is brass, so you'll be fine to print out those small test strands and it shouldn't do much damage to that brass nozzle. But if you do plan on printing with a lot of abrasives, you'll want to upgrade to a different nozzle that's a bit more wear resistant. On stream, we took off the housing for the extruder and hot end, and what we found was a bit underwhelming. The extruder is a pretty standard, low cost plastic extruder with a single gear, and the cooling fan is very, very small, and the fan shroud only hits the part from one side, so it's really not going to be doing you any favors when it comes to part cooling. The hot end did look fairly unique and had sort of a hexagon shape, and we did start a print on stream that was looking really nice, but because there is no filament runout sensor and because the strands of filament are incredibly small, it ran out about midway through the print and only was able to print half of the part. Plugging the included micro SD card into the computer, I found their Voxel Maker Slicer. I did take a look at this for a bit, and there are some settings that may be fine for someone new to 3D printing, but coming from Cura or Prusa Slicer, it is pretty bare bones. Luckily, the machine is using just standard G-code, so you can use any slicer as long as you build a profile for this printer. I started off in Cura with the Ender 3 S1 profile since they had the same footprint and were both direct drive units. Starting with PLA, I printed out a threaded dragon egg model from Things. All of the models that we show in this video will be linked in the description, so if you do see something that you like, the links are down there so you can check out that model, print it out for yourself, or check out the 3D artist's other work. Print quality wise, I was pretty happy with the dragon egg. However, the first one's threads were so tight that once I got it closed, I couldn't get it to unthread. I then resliced at a slightly slower speed and 0.16 layer height. This time it was a bit better, but I still wasn't able to thread the model entirely. At this point, I wasn't sure if it was the model or the print that was the issue. 
So I went over to Prusa Printers, which is now Printables, and printed out the nut and bolt model that I've printed quite a few times before. Just like before, I was happy with the print quality, but the nut would not thread down the bolt, so I knew that it was the print because I've done this model plenty of times before and know that it should thread much easier. I then opened up the Voxel Lab slicer and re-sliced that initial egg. This time when I printed it, it was much easier to thread and I was able to just about thread it on and off entirely. I also reprinted the nut and bolt and that was able to thread completely. I'm not entirely sure what factor it was in the Ender 3 S1 profile that wasn't playing nicely with the Aquila S2, but I am happy that it was just a matter of slicing or some sort of issue with the slicing that was causing it and not a matter of the printer not being able to hit these sort of thread tolerances. I tried my luck with 3D Printing World's Planetary Egg model and the actual egg looked great, but I wasn't able to get the gap just right for the gear system on the bottom. I believe the issue with this is the powder coated PEI. The gears require very precise spacing and with powder coated PEI, the first layer pushes into the bed more so than with other beds. I would recommend using something like Smooth PEI, Glass, or even BuildTac to get a bit more clearance on the first layer. Chaos Cortec released a Stormtrooper bunny model that I've had my eyes on, so I sliced that up next. I actually ended up printing it out four different times. The model requires a fair amount of support, so I started off in Cura with tree supports. These printed out fine, but they weren't dense enough to support the bottom of the helmet and one of the arms, so I re-sliced it with standard Cura supports, and they just about welded to the part. At this point, I decided to hop over to Prusa Slicer and create a profile based off of an Ender. I've been using that slicer much more lately, and I really like their support system. First print with Prusa Slicer was much better, but still not perfect with the auto-generated support. Supports. On my final attempt, I went with custom supports and their snug settings. This turned out perfect and I was super happy with the end result. I then switched to PETG and printed a vase that I was very pleased with, as well as the fan shroud for the Rat Rig V Minion. There are some overhangs on the shroud and the S2 really did not like that. The small fan moves air, but not a ton and it only hits the model from one side. The side it hits looks great, but the other side was really messy. I printed it out a second time to verify this and the results were the exact same. I then threw an enclosure on the printer and printed out the Voron Stealth Burner face and ABS. I was very happy with the results and being able to print ABS at the higher temps I like on a stock budget machine was sweet. I tried the included nylon that came with the printer on a gear model and I used a little bit of glue stick on the powder coated PEI to help with the adhesion for that nylon and the adhesion was great. The downside is that even though they did have a small packet of desiccant, the nylon was very wet and I could hear it popping. The print did complete and it was successful, but it would have looked better if the filament didn't have so much moisture in it. The last filament I tried out was TPU and it was a swing and a miss. The S2 was just not having it. I dried the TPU, adjusted retraction, turned off retraction, played around with speeds, tried different models, different gaps, and no matter what, after just a little bit of printing, the TPU would clog inside of the extruder. Typically when I'm printing with TPU, I adjust the tension on the extruder. For rigid materials, you want it to be a bit tighter, and for flexibles that are softer, you want to back it off a bit so it's not quite pinching into the material. And looking around the extruder, I didn't see any apparent way to do that. I took off the housing and I still did not see it. So for some that might not be a big deal if you don't have any intention to print with TPU, the tension of the extruder arm from factory seems perfectly capable of printing with rigid materials, but if you are wanting to print with TPU, I certainly would not recommend going with the S2 with this current extruder setup. After using the Aquila S2 for some time now, I want to go through the things that I like about the machine and the things that I think need some improvements. Starting with the good. At $300, having an all-metal hot end on a budget 3D printer is just not something that we see. I'm not saying it's the only 3D printer that exists in that price point that has an all-metal hot end, but as of right now, I cannot think of any of the Creality or Ender type machines that are $300 or less. I know they now have the Sprite setup, which is uh, a bit more expensive, but anything below that to have an all-metal hot end from factory is something you just don't see, so the machine certainly gets some points for that. I do typically prefer a direct drive extruder over a Bowden extruder, so I was happy to see them go from a Bowden to a direct drive on the S2. A powder coated PEI flex plate system is my absolute favorite form of build surface, so I'm really happy to see that also coming with this machine and that that is something that more 3D printers are starting to come with. With all that being said, the S2 definitely has some things that I am not crazy about, starting with that extruder. I like that it's a direct drive extruder, 
but it does not get any more bare bones than a single geared plastic extruder, especially one that doesn't seem to have any way to adjust tension. With so many other manufacturers using some sort of a BMG or Aero clone or Creality with their new Sprite extruder, it's just hard to understand why on a new machine you would go with such an old design of extruder. Yes, it works, but it just is really, really bare bones. And I think that they should have shown a bit more love to the extruder. Next is layer cooling fans. And depending on what you're getting this machine for, that might not be a big deal if you're getting it for things like ABS and nylon. Typically you don't really use a layer cooling fan unless you're doing some extreme overhangs or extreme bridging. But if you are wanting to print with PLA and PETG, the layer cooling fan is very small. There's only one of them. And that also means it's a bit noisier, but the, the thing that they could have done is that the way the fan shroud is, it's only hitting the part from one direction. So if they had at least done some sort of a splitting fan shroud, so that way the air could hit the part from both sides, that would have definitely been an improvement. But as we saw from printing with PETG and the overhangs, it just is not able to adequately cool a part that has a lot of overhangs. The last is with the powder coated PEI flex plate system. The PEI spring steel itself to me is solid. I've had no issues with it. It's actually thicker than what a lot of the flex plates are that come with these budget 3D printers. The issue I ran into was with the magnetic sheet itself. Around the time I was printing ABS, I noticed that little pieces of the magnet were getting stuck to the PEI. And when I pulled it up, it was actually taking some of the magnet with it. Considering I've only had this machine for a few months and it's primarily been used for testing and it hasn't been in a, you know, print after print after print after print environment, I don't feel that this should be happening so quickly. And I, again, think that the main issue is that they just went with a really low cost magnet. The standout feature on the Aquila S2 is absolutely that 300 Celsius hot end. And I can certainly see this machine as being a machine for someone that wants to get into some of those higher temp prints, but is on a budget and either doesn't want to mod or doesn't feel comfortable with modding another machine. For those that do feel comfortable modding, the original Aquila is around $200. And with that $100 difference, you can get a much better direct drive extruder and a much better hot end than what comes stock on this machine. I do feel like the S2 is a welcome addition to the Aqua the family. And if they can just get a fan shroud that at least splits or is slightly better, I believe the fan shroud was 3D printed, so it shouldn't be difficult to provide us with an STL file or you know start shipping the new machines with a different fan shroud and a better bed of magnets that at $300, it is a nice low cost option for someone that wants to start experimenting with these higher temp materials. And that has been the Aquila S2. I hope that you enjoyed this video and then I was able to answer the majority of your questions about this printer. If you have any questions about anything I covered or did not cover, let me know in the comments down below and I will do my absolute best to answer those questions. And if I don't have the answer, I have no problem reaching out to the manufacturer to get those answers for you. I would also love to know what your thoughts are on the Aquila S2. And if you were given the chance to either have the original Aquila and $100 to upgrade that machine or just get the Aquila S2 in its current state to just print with these higher temp materials out of the box, which would you choose? I, I think that a lot of the people that watch my channel have preferred to go the modding route, but I'm really curious to see um, what the split is and how many people would just rather have the machine that is ready with the all metal hot end out of the box. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Dana from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.